Hello, my name is Alex Kloish, and today I'm going to be telling you about the evolution of the golf ball. To begin, let me tell you why I chose this topic. Before my father had kids, he was a semi-professional golfer playing in some high-stakes tournaments. He had to give up this dream to start a life that involved kids, but he never gave up his passion for the sport. Personally, I never had the patience for golf, but I always found the biomechanics of a swing and the equipment used just fascinating. After Professor Mall mentioned golf clubs in class, I knew golf balls were the perfect way to relate my, glo- my love of the equipment and have a unique idea. To, now, to start the, uh, now to start the presentation with a little bit of history. The concept of hit object with stick has been around, around since the dawn of time, but only in the last 600 years has the stick had a proper ball to hit. The first actual golf ball was the feathers, as seen on the right. This ball was made by boiling goose feathers and stuffing them into a leather stack and, sack and stitching it closed. This ball had multiple drawbacks. First, it wasn't weather resistant, meaning that it couldn't be played in cold or wet weather. The, uh, if played, the ball would basically turn into a hacky sack and kind of melt down. The second drawback was that it was extremely expensive, as goose feathers are kind of a rare material, and the, the feathery was extremely time consuming to make. Now for the next iteration of the golf ball, the gutty ball. The ball was created around 1850 and it completely changed ga- golf. <laughs> the ball is made from sap from the sapodilla tree, which was heated and molded round. One of the groundbreaking things with this ball was the manufacturing process. Because the materials required were so easy to find and the simplicity to craft, gutty balls could be mass produced, thereby opening up golf to the poor, where feathery balls where feathery balls were expensive, gutty balls were cheap. Over time, people began to chip away at their balls, slowly realizing that balls with chips and imperfection perfections actually flew better than balls that were perfectly smooth. This accidental discovery led to the discovery of dimples which I will talk about later. Now to begin explaining the structure, property, and performance qualities of all four components of the modern golf ball, which can be seen on the right. To begin, we'll talk about the core. This is by far the most important piece of the golf ball. It is mainly regarded as the engine, meaning that it will determine how far and fast the ball will fly. In the 80s, both liquid and solid cores were tested, but most people have decided that solid cores are better and they're easier to produce. Solid cores are made out of polybutadiene, which is a synthetic rubber. The main performance of the core lies in the compression with which it is made. This refers to the density of the polybutadiene in the core, and a high compression core with, will fly farther and spin faster, and although these traits seem positive, they make the ball tedious and unforgiving to hit, which can cause problems for novice golfers. Next component is the layers. Now the layers aren't nearly as important, but they still play a role in how the ball flies. Usually, a modern golf ball will have three to five layers. Layers function to enhance certain characteristics, certain characteristics the cover or core might have, meaning that some layers are designed to decrease spin, while some might help the ball fly further. These layers are made of thermoplastic resins called ionomers. The most used is called HPF 1000, which is specifically used for golf balls. The outer portion of the golf ball is called the cover, which is how we all see the golf ball, the white, the white surface with dimples, which I'll get into. This is a durable surface. It has to, it is subject to the repetitive stress the golf club inflicts. Cover is made of urethane, which is a specific combination combination of disocyanates and polyols. In comparison to the layers and core, the cover is mundane, but still very important to the way the golf ball can be hit, as it adds a ton of structural strength. The last portion of the modern golf ball lies on the cover, the dimples. As I mentioned, the dimple effect on golf balls were found on accident by using chipped gutty balls. In my opinion, the dimples are actually incredibly interesting and probably the most interesting part of this report. To get into the aerodynamics of dimples, first we have to understand lift and drag. Lift is the upward force wind exerts on the ball, while drag is the negative horizontal force. Basically, dimples create a thin layer of air that clings to the surface of the ball, allowing it to cut through the air more efficiently, which lowers the drag force experienced by the ball, allowing it to fly further and faster. Here's the manufacturing process, which I actually made myself. Now, first rubber blocks, the core, so polybutadiene, are molded in a compressor. Now the round core is put between halves of the cover layer. The two pieces of cover are pressed together, sealing the two halves into one ball. The dimple pattern is stamped onto the cover of the ball, and the ball is labeled and ready for production. Now this manufacturing seems pretty mundane and not terribly unique, but thousands of golf balls are made every hour. It, It can't be a terribly tedious process. And thank you for listening to my presentation. I hope 
you all learned, uh, you all, I hope you all have a better understanding of the history and engineering that goes into the production of golf balls. Thank you very much.